Welcome to another episode of Follow the Brand. I am your host, Grant McGaw, CEO of Five Star BDM, a five star personal branding and business development company. I want to take you on a journey that takes another deep dive into the world of personal branding and business development using compelling personal story, business conversations, and tips to improve your personal brand. By listening to the Follow the Brand podcast series, you will be able to differentiate yourself from the competition and allow you to build trust with prospective clients and employers. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Make it one that will set you apart, build trust, and reflect who you are. Developing your five-star personal brand is a great way to demonstrate your skills and knowledge. If you have any questions for me or my guests, please email me at grant.magaw, spelled M-C-G-A-U-G-H, at 5 star BDM, B for brand, D for development, M for masters.com. Now let's begin with our next five star episode on Follow the Brand. Crypto and the digital frontier begs the question what new dimensions will the metaverse open for sustainability? I advise you to force yourself to understand the new economy of this century. You will need to know how to acquire new business on a new playing field called the Metaverse. Have you strategized your service or product distribution model in the virtual world of Web 3.0? Programmable money in the form of NFTs and security tokens offers a unique moment in financial history. You can now self-fund your startup business through NFTs in the blockchain world. Early adopters of technology are creating securities tokens with real real estate assets. Fractionalized real estate ownership of specific real estate rights through security tokenization is a new frontier. You will be able to rapidly integrate, authenticate, and authorize real-world transactions for web, mobile, and legacy applications. API security solutions built for developers and trusted by global enterprises. Mike Lingle is the CFO of Security Token Market, where he focuses on the coming wave of digital asset securities. He founded RocketProforma.com to help startups quickly create financial projections. Mike is a former software developer who raised venture capital, launched more than one presentation company, had an exit, and ran several startup accelerator programs. He's an entrepreneur in residence at Founder Institute. Let us welcome Mike Lingle to the Follow the Brand podcast, where we are building a five-star brand that you can follow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great episode on the Follow the Brand podcast. We are in our financial empowerment series, and we've got today a, he's one, he's a good friend of mine. We, we're, we're LinkedIn buddies. Let's put it like that. So we interact we <laughs> with each other, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, uh, twice a week, depending on what it is, because we like what each other is doing in our respective field. So Mike Lingle, uh, as you may or may not know, does a lot when it comes to helping startups uh, understand the financial conversation, how to frame the finances in a way that's going to be attractive when you're looking at venture capitalism and things of that nature. He's very, very well-versed in cryptocurrencies and what's happening in that world. And I'm learning more and more as I work with uh, Mike you know, around real estate tokens, securities tokens, all these other things that, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. They're not familiar to me. And that's why we're having this podcast. So we can educate the consumer, educate people on, on what it takes to understand the economic landscape. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Mike Lingle. Hello. Uh, 
Thanks for having me on the show. Great to be on the podcast. As as you said, we interact on LinkedIn, so I see all your uh, and hear all your great shows as they come past. So it is uh, an honor and a privilege to be one of your guests finally. So thanks. Excellent. Not 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 a problem at all. I I want to pick your brain. Uh, I, I no bones about it because I'm curious. I'm very curious. First, how did you get started? You know, helping uh, startups and finance. Uh, you know, give us that contest around that. Sure. Um, I started my own company. I started my own startup uh, pretty much just a few years out of college. And uh, it was a tech startup. I was a good software developer. And it went pretty well. And all of a sudden, I was managing a room full of people, which is very different than writing software. And um, it went great until it didn't. Right. And what happened was the economy hiccuped. Actually, it was the dot com crash. Um, so the economy uh, hiccuped. Everyone, all of our customers stopped paying their bills. We couldn't sign new customers. And I didn't really have a handle on, like, I knew what my bank account was. Right. And I knew we had contracts signed with customers, but I wasn't really projecting into the future. And I certainly wasn't stress testing the projections into the future. Right. And so all of a sudden I found I had a business partner at the time and we found ourselves laying off some really good people who we had hired and promised that we would have money to pay their salaries. And all of a sudden we didn't. Right. So it. 20. I guess I was around. I started my business at 25 and that happened when I was 30. So it was kind of early in my startup career. And um, I ended up my business partner left. Uh, We ended up in debt. I ended up rebuilding the business um that became we ended up raising i brought in a new business partner we raised some venture capital that company went much better uh partially because i understood the finances a lot better you know i had i had learned a lot during my uh during my crash and burn years and so that company eventually got acquired and then i started working with other founders and i realized that everyone else has the same problem like every founder is a builder Right. And then all of a sudden they're asked to make financial decisions and that can be challenging. Right. They don't understand it. They don't want to understand it. Um, So it was at that moment when I started working with other founders, I was running startup accelerator programs and I just kept seeing the same thing from other people that I had experienced in my own in my own career path. So talk to me about some of those common challenges, you know, and I'm sure my audience is like, yeah. Mike, I, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so it's so shed some light around that. Yeah. So so I think, and again, I think a lot of us start companies because we build things, right? And that skill of building something cool that people love is very different than running a business, right? And I think it's easy to lose sight as a builder that business, like the whole point of a business is numbers and finance and that's really what running a business is it's understanding the numbers and managing uh, you know managing the numbers right and um and actually the single most effective thing that we as founders can do in order to improve our chances of success are to understand our numbers right but we lose sight of that because we're really busy building um and i just it's just a challenge i've seen over and over and over again and so i've taken it upon myself to make it easier for non-financial people to get a handle on the numbers. Um, And usually the the excuse is they have to go pitch investors. So exactly what you were saying, right? Like, and I can talk about that. Like, how do we package this for investors? What do we say? How do we show the numbers? How do we talk through the numbers? Right. That's important. And that's what gets us money. It's also a chance for us to understand our own business and get a handle on our numbers. So whether or not we raise money, we still have to drive the car, right? And um, and someone was explaining this, uh, someone said yesterday, you know, they're a business owner and they're trying to figure out their financials and they're like, my window's fogged up, right? I'm driving, but I can't really see out the window because I don't have the financial forecast in place and I need to unfog the window. And I was like, yeah, and you have passengers in the car, right? Like everyone whose salary you're paying is relying on you to be able to drive and you have a foggy window, right? So the financials, whether or not we're raising money, allow us to unfog the window and uh, 
help our passengers, uh, which is exactly the issue, you know, exactly the the crashed car that I had as a uh, as an early entrepreneur. Wow. Well, I know you've developed a program. I think you call it Rocket Rocket Forma. Am I right? Rocket Pro Forma. Pro Rocket Forma. Pro Forma. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So tell tell me a little, little bit about what what exactly does that entail, and how does that help to unfog the windows? Yeah. So, um, I guess uh, it, it really, what I started out doing when I started working with other founders is I would build their financial projections. So as part of my recovery from crashing my own car, when I was rebuilding my business, I forced myself to learn the financials piece. And I started doing my own books and QuickBooks and studying the financials piece. And I had gotten pretty good. So when I brought in a business partner and we went out to raise venture capital, I had built most of the financial model that we were using to raise the venture capital, right? So I had really turned my own ship around. Then when I started working with other, so that company, we raised a couple rounds of VC, it got acquired. When um, I was working with other entrepreneurs, the first thing I tried to do was build them fancy financial projections, which was like, I would hand them this, this financial projection. They would not understand it at all. They would have no ability to explain it. They couldn't use it to to drive the business. They couldn't use it to explain to investors. They couldn't make changes themselves. And I realized that wasn't helping, right? Mm -hmm. So then the question became, is there something I can create that's a middle ground, right? So is there some uh, interface or setup that makes it easy for founders who aren't numbers people to go in and that was a product I created called Rocket Pro Forma, where you can go in and you can say, you know, I'm doing a subscription model or I'm creating a two-sided marketplace or whatever, set the pricing for the three years, right? Set your customer targets for the three years. And then the spreadsheet does all the work for you. And then if you want to change something, you just change your pricing for year three and the, the product does all the work for you. So that's what I created. Uh, and then I recorded a bunch of little videos. So as you're sitting there looking at something and you have a question, there's like a minute of me pop that you can pop up on the screen to explain stuff. And in my mind, this was going to be completely self-sufficient, right? People could just get the product, watch the videos, fill it out. What happened, what has happened is that people want at least an hour of time um, from someone to explain it, which for a long time was just me. And then I ended up building a network of, uh, financial coaches. So now there are a bunch of people who know a lot more about startup financials than I do, um, who can hop in and uh, provide that coaching. So you're sitting there with the product, you can have someone help you set it up. And then you walk away knowing how to update it yourself, right? Wow, I think that's exciting. So now it's automated. And you can see tutorials for videos, and you can get uh, live chat. Let's call it like that. Live chat. Yeah, like with like a, a human. Yeah, exactly. like with a human being. What what a novel a concept. Human being. Yeah, <laughs> it's and like then, from the nineteen nineties. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, and it works today. You know, talking to <laughs> a live today. human being. Yeah. Because if you've yeah, got to yeah. get into an investor presentation, this is where I have found people struggle. Um, I work with a, another company called Cornhusker Capital. And they do a lot when it comes to investment banking. They help a lot of uh, small to mid-sized businesses, entrepreneurs. Some of them are a little bit further down the track. You know, they might be you know, in between like a one to $3 million in, in EBITDA, for instance. And then they're either looking at a, a merger acquisition, a capital raise, or some type of uh, exit strategy uh, for, their, for their business. And you see a lot of pitch decks. You know, a, lo a lot mm -hmm. of pitch deck, but you got to be able to explain your numbers. Like, okay, I see you've got a certain revenue uh, that you've, you know, it, it's confirmed for the last, you know, two, three years, some kind of uh, track. And then how are you, uh, how are you getting to this number in the future? You know, or yep. where is that? Yep. Where where is that coming from? Right, right. And, and, and I'm sure you come across that as well. Yeah, and a lot of the time, so so a couple things there. One is um, QuickBooks is backward looking, right? So it only looks into the past. And what we're talking about here is looking into the future, right? 
And so if you have existing financials and some history, right, that creates a great foundation that you can use to then project forward using Rocket Pro Forma. A lot of the startups I work with um, don't have any history, like they're very early stage. And so then you don't have anything to, to hang your hat on, right? So then um, it's a combination of pulling numbers out of thin air, which can actually be kind of fun. If you like play with the numbers and create these giant sales projections, you're like, wow, look at all this I could do. Um, and then researching likely answers, right? There are always industry standard answers that you can put in there. And then exactly what you just said, how can I tie this back to reality, right? And the biggest place where we need to be realistic is on the customer acquisition. That's always the hardest thing, right? In our minds as builders, we're going to create this thing. Everyone's going to love it. That will never be a problem with, with customers. And in real life, what happens is we create these things and then it's really hard to get people to use it. It's really hard to sell it, right? So the companies that win figure out how to acquire customers, right? So Microsoft, for example, used back in the, I'm, I guess I'm, you know, I have gray hair, but they used IBM as a distribution partner and basically got access to all of IBM's customers as a, when Microsoft was a startup, right? And that completely transformed their ability, they didn't need the best product because they had the best distribution channels, right? And so that that piece that you mentioned, like what is the realistic path to customer acquisition, right? All the spreadsheet magic in the world doesn't, doesn't take that away. No, nah, you can benchmark all you want and maybe you can uh, take similar companies and see how, how they've shown uh, growth trajectories and then you've got to be able to show that there's a demand. You know, what is yeah. the demand for your product? How are you unique? What's your key differentiator in the marketplace that's going to make you relevant and not a commodity? It's like, well, I could buy that from anywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you've got a unique value proposition and that solves uh, a problem, and, and then we got to look at uh, time to market, right? How quickly do does the client or customer or business need to acquire your service in order to solve that problem. Um, and can you look at that? You know, is that realistic or, or, or not? And then you see people say right now, and we'll, we'll switch gear just a little bit, the big buzz, big buzz right now with cryptocurrencies, uh, Bitcoin, uh, NFT, right. metaverse, all these different things. This is a new market, basically what it comes down to. And then there's speculation, you know, it's like yes. the gold rush times, right? And then they put these, uh, you know, valuations out there of what it could look like. So I always, when I have these kinds of conversations, I, I take people back 20 years. You got to think about, remember the dot-com boom mm-hmm. and then the dot-com bust, kind of what you just talked about earlier, you know, 20, Correct. 20 years ago. That doesn't mean that people that were doing e-commerce uh, shopping or, or carts, and they were putting this all together. They were wrong. It's just needed time to mature, and there was a lot of valuations that went out there, and there was time to get it out there and and adopt it by um, the consumer. For instance, telehealth has been around for a long time, but mm-hmm. was it adopted by the healthcare system when it first came out? No, it wasn't. But then, obviously, as we've seen with COVID uh, coming out, customers. Clients yeah. or patients could not get out of their home and tell them, like, hey, I'm going to adopt that right now. So it doesn't mean that the product or service is, is uh, something wrong with it or it's a bad idea, nothing like that. But customer adoption could change everything. So, mm-hmm. so when people are talking about Bitcoin, they're talking about uh, cryptocurrencies, they're talking about blockchain. You're talking about, I see you talk a lot about that. Well, what's your take on those things? So, um, I think there are a a few important things. Bitcoin, Ethereum, crypto. It's the first time I've seen a new form of money exchange created since credit cards, right? And that only comes along every once in a while. You can transact with real dollars across the globe using this uh, essentially financial system that's been built outside of the financial system. And so that is hugely transformational, right? 
whether you have made money on it or not, the ability to do that is transformational. And then the jump from Bitcoin, which accomplished that, to Ethereum, which is programmable money. So it takes that system and adds logic to it. So now you can program your tokens to behave the way you want them to behave. So now you have programmable money. That is a revolution, right? Regardless of whether we're speculating or not speculating, like that has some legs. This episode is brought to you by Five Star BDM. Five Star BDM is a professional consulting and advisory group keenly focused on business development services for small to mid-sized businesses and entrepreneurs. Although every business is unique, they often share challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. Services include process improvement and operations, digital strategy and transformation, business intelligence, digital marketing, and personal branding. Our five-star business and personal branding company has helped a number of professionals and organizations to optimize and grow. The result is more business, more opportunities, better reach, positive outcomes. Please visit www.5starbdm.com to learn more and view all the episodes of Follow the Brand. Um, and it'll probably be another 20 years, 30 years before we see another form of money created again, right? So this is like a unique moment in history. Um, so that gets me excited, right? When I think about that, um, I spend a lot of my time in the NFT space because I really like what's happening there. Uh, NFTs are an amazing way for startups to self-fund right? The startups who get the NFT launches right are able to raise hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on their own without investors. And because there are secondary sale commissions, if they get the NFT collection right and people are buying and selling it, there's a steady stream of income on the back end. It, and you haven't given away any equity in the company, right? So if you can figure it out, there and it's legal. So there is an amazing opportunity to self-fund uh, right now that some startups are really pulling off in an incredibly powerful way. Well, man, Mike, you just said that. I hope the audience realizes what he just said. That's a drop the mic moment, you know, because the normal process that startups had to go through was to do, you know, you come up with your uh, valuation and your projections and you pitch it to the venture capital world or private equity world and if somebody buys into your idea and then they, you know, you, you come up with some kind of a contract in which, you know, monies are exchanged and there, there's a buyback and all kinds of other stuff. And then you're on the hook because, you know, no one's giving you money. There, there's a, there's a, there's a, you're going to have to pay that money back uh, in a certain amount of time or give up a lot of equity in the company and, 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 all, and so forth and so forth. Now you've got a way to present your idea to a lot of different people through NFTs. And if you were in the software business, even before you got into, you know, the uh, uh, the finance business, you, I know the lights have just gone on in your head because uh, yeah. you, you see that, understand the programmable. People are like, well, that just, that's just a picture. It's just a JPEG. But it's a smart contract embedded in that JPEG. And yeah. now you've got some smart branding, as I like to say, that's going there you on. Go. And then you're now putting it out on a uh, a blockchain, right? That's what the Ethereum uh, blockchain is. And then you've got an agreement of exchange with not only individuals, companies, but countries that agree on some value on that NFT. Am I on the right track? Yeah, yeah. And and crypto as well. I mean, the Ukraine, I was reading yesterday, the Ukraine has received $100 million of funding in crypto in the past two weeks. Right, like this is a working monetary global monetary system. Yeah, that that's the and here was you know my um, my father asked me. So you're telling me you can take this you know digital currency and and it has a I guess an agreed upon value that's really not backed by anything but data and take it to the bank and withdraw money. 
And I said, yeah. <laughs> Am I yeah. right? Yes, although banks hate crypto, so you have to go through Coinbase or one of the other on-ramps. I say this, I've been trying to get bank accounts set up for a startup I'm working with, and whenever we say we're going to touch crypto, the bank is like, no way. <laughs> so uh, you do the exchange on Coinbase and then pull your U.S. dollars off of Coinbase into your bank account, and that seems to work better. Yeah, and, uh, and I understand. It's just like uh, if you have pesos or you have rubles, let's say for the Russians, let's see whatever that's worth right now. However, you still have to do an exchange to turn it into dollars if you're going to do that. Correct, so, correct. The, so the concept is not different. And it goes back to what I was, uh, when I had this conversation, I said, look, you know, you know, just like oil was the new money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, data, data is the new money. Meaning, and, I, and he said, well, explain it to me. I said, if you lose your phone, your smartphone, you lose your phone, nine times a 10, very quickly, you're going to spend money to retrieve that a new phone or retrieve that data because that data is is worth a lot of money. Does that make sense? Correct. The data is worth more than the phone, right? Like the phone is replaceable. The data is harder to replace. You spend years collecting that data. Well, that's it. That's it. So, you know, when you realize that and you understand how uh, blockchain works, that it's a ledger. Um, so it's capped in a, a lot of different areas, not just one location, not just in your phone. So uh, and but the, there is a key to that. Right. So there is some kind of I don't know. It, it's a wallet. You get a wallet. And if you lose the access to that wallet, then you might have a problem. <laughs> Am I right? Correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh the wallets are not easy to manage, especially if you're not used to them. And it's, it is easy to irretrievably lose your crypto. So be careful. Yeah. Yeah. But well, we, we got to get used to that. You know, just like if you didn't have your ATM uh, pen, that's going to be a problem or you lost your you know, identification uh, for whatever reason, uh, you, you're trying to access your bank account. How does that happen? So it's not nothing new. You just need to understand the process that are involved. And now you're starting to see, because I, I thought even today that you had put out some information that I thought was interesting on real estate and the real estate, you know, uh, uh, tokenization market. And then you yes. start thinking about metaverse and you're buying digital real estate. Help me understand that more. Okay. So this is one of my favorite topics right now. So if I buy a uh, uh, Ethereum token, as you pointed out, as your dad said, you're not buying a share of the Ethereum corporation, right? There's no underlying asset. You are in an unregulated market buying a token that has no underlying asset. It is, the value is essentially what we all agree the value is, right? If you buy an NFT, you have one owner and one asset. Now that asset may be a picture of a, whatever, a monkey or a dog or whatever, right? But there is an asset there. And one owner, you created essentially a baby security, right? It's a baby share of ownership of this like individual. Like a stock, right? It's like a little thing. stock. It's like a stock. It's like yeah. a little stock. If you take one step, and so that's as far as the crypto world is willing to go, because crypto has this vibe of like, we're not going to follow any rules. We're going to exist outside the financial system. If you take one more step, if you add multiple owners or multiple assets or a cash stream or the title to some real estate, you have agreed to create a security. Right, you now have to follow securities laws in the United States and other countries. And if you flip the script and say, you know, we are going to use blockchain for this, right? But we're going to follow securities laws and we're going to be legally compliant. You can now create. Remember when I said uh, programmable money? You can now create programmable securities, right? So you can take one step further. And if you do that and you do it legally you open up this amazing world of every public and private asset that exists that is much larger than the crypto and NFT world that we're operating in right now. And that, to me, is the biggest opportunity on the board, right? And blockchain enables that. That's an on-ramp into the uh, blue chip, let's put it like that. Into Correct. Because <laughs> so now we can... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's where the new economy 
And that's what I call, you know, cryptocurrency. The new economy now meets the blue chip economy. And then, Correct. you know, myself or my son can now talk to his grandfather monetarily. Right. That's right. And and so what the real estate report is, and so I'm in the startup world. I've been a startup guy for 25 years, right? I have pretty much never seen real estate be the early adopter of any technology, right? Real estate moves very slowly. It is very old school. Um, in this instance, if we're taking tokens, you know, taking blockchain and we're creating securities, real estate is all over this. Real estate is the first mover. Most of the security tokens that have been created are real estate assets. Um, and all of a sudden, real estate is saying, this is the greatest invention. We're going to be the first movers on this new technology, which just blows my mind, right? So the report is I work with a team here in Miami um, that advises uh, on how to structure these security tokens. And so this is everything we're seeing in the market, right? All the innovative stuff that people are doing with these new programmable securities in the real estate space. And what you're able to do, you're able to get liquidity earlier, right? Like if we think about a big commercial real estate project, if I bring in investors to that project, those investors are locked up for five to seven years. If I can tokenize part of that project, those investors can get out earlier, or at least know that they could get out, even if they don't actually get out, that makes them feel better. And other investors can come in who aren't necessarily uh, primary real estate investors. So I get access to a broader community of investors. And it takes, if I'm a real estate developer, it takes the ticking clock off of my head. Because if I have those investors, I have to sell the property within five to seven years in order to get them out and pay them back, right? But if I can tokenize and they can get out on their own, I don't have to sell the property. So I can hold the property much longer and the property becomes more and more profitable the longer I hold it. And I get to avoid the tax hit of having to sell it, right? So for developers, this is like, this is like a dream come true. Now help, so that's a physical d- development. You know. Physical asset, yeah. Physical asset. Explain to us what's going on now in this metaverse, whether buying right. digital real estate. Does that apply there or is it different? Uh, so, yes, but the digital assets right now, a lot of it's happening via NFTs. So, again, we're back to crypto and baby securities, right? So, really, what you're buying is you're buying uh, an NFT, one owner, one asset. You become the owner of the metaverse real estate asset. And that is all being done via via NFTs right now, mostly because the metaverse is unregulated, right? It's not like a real estate title. It's not a physical asset. Um, and there is definitely a land rush right now. Um, so I, I think the things that are similar to existing real estate is if you have a world, like a virtual world, there are big players who have uh, planted flags in that world. Mm-hmm. Right. So you might have uh, it could be a, a, a Web2 brand, like a, a real world brand like Nike. It could be a virtual brand like the Board Ape Yacht Club. Snoop Dogg is all over the metaverse. So Snoop Dogg might have built a mansion right there. And if you buy land around those uh, those larger entities, that land goes up in value. Right. As it gets developed and as more people come in, you're sitting there and that works exactly like real uh, real world real estate. I think what's a little different is anyone can spin up a new world at any time, right? So your plot next to Snoop Dogg's mansion is cool in the one world, but Snoop Dogg may open up a mansion in another world, Yeah. right? And then that becomes confusing because you're in a hall of mirrors and there's like infinite worlds, unlike the real world where there's only one Miami, only one New York City, right? Like when you buy a plot of land in New York City, you own a plot of land in New York City. This is a little bit more of uh, shifting sands and what's what's the fad right now? Let, let me ask you this question, because as you brought something up, so that like web, the web, you know, in the building of web sites, that and, and, and purchasing a domain. I think most people are aware of that. And you open in a business, not only you want a physical business or whatever it might be, you say, oh yeah, I also need, uh, after you like, let's say you've developed an LLC, right, or an S corp, right. or something to that effect, 
And it makes sense to then uh, purchase a domain because if you've got Mike Lingle, um, I do, you know, MikeLingle.com. There you go. <laughs> and you would, you would purchase that, right? And that would be your, yeah. and that really gives you digital ownership of, of, of that domain, right? And that gets you that what we call, you know, build on the website is Web 2.0. Web 3.0 now puts you into 3D, right? So now you're going to purchase uh, MikeLingle.com, or you might call it something completely de- different, Mike Lingle's Metaverse, and you're purchasing yeah. that space and you're you know, uh, up and operational in business. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, you can get a dot Ethereum domain, for example. So you'll see people on Twitter with like Mike Lingle dot ETH, E-T-H um, which is both a destination and a place to send uh, crypto to. Um, I think in the metaverse, you need, you really need, well, you need three things, right? You need the land, right? So there's that. You need to look like something. So you need some kind of avatar or graphic of yourself, right? Which is part of the reason people like, um, you know, like, for example, they have a certain status to them now, right? It's like, it's like joining a fancy club, like a fancy expensive club. If you're walking around looking like a bored ape and you own that NFT because they're expensive, right? Uh, and then the third thing I think you need is a sweet ride. So, you know, some way to get around the metaverse. <laughs> and there are some pretty sweet rides out there. And that's cool. But now, here's a good thing. Just like in a website, right? Like you could create your own if you wanted to, but it's going to look like you created your own if you're not a web designer, yeah. right? So as you then translate that into the metaverse, you're going to probably have to contract with either uh, you know, a designer, you know, either a virtual reality designer or a, a augmented reality designer. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think um, you'll actually see some of the collections. So people are trying to solve this problem. Yes. So yes, you can hire architects and uh, interior designers. Those all exist virtually. Um, and I've seen people do it and you can build some pretty cool stuff. Uh, there are also NFT projects that are starting to uh, pop up in the metaverse. So like, so there was a, basically a, a virtual sneaker company called Artifact, R-T-F-K-T. They did a bunch of virtual sneaker collaborations with famous sneaker designers like Jeff Staple and some other folks over the last year, um, got super famous and then dropped, uh, uh, like an avatar collection right at the end of last year called Clone X, right? And if you're holding a Clone X, they are now dropping uh, basically like little apartments that you can set up in the metaverse that you can customize. So you now have a physical space that's been designed by this company uh, for your avatar, right? And it's all meant to be plug and play. Like I just dropped my apartment into the metaverse. I've got my avatar, Um Right. So they're trying to solve that problem by by giving you a space that looks cool that you can customize and use. Yeah, I'm sure the uh, options and the the things that you are able to do are going to be enormous. And that'll start bringing the price down like everything else. Now, when new tech comes out, it's usually pretty expensive. And then as time goes on, especially when there's new versions that come out, that tech is not as nearly as expensive when it first came out. Right. So you're going to start seeing uh, more and more people get involved with the metaverse. The other thing is, how do you you really participate in it? Do I need the Oculus glasses? You know, what are other ways that, you know, what what are, that's a good question. What are the ways that people are interacting with the metaverse? The Oculus 2 gets a lot of rave reviews from the people I've talked to. So that's certainly a way to do it. You can also participate in the metaverse without any kind of VR. Like you can just, call something up on your computer and it, it's like one of those old uh like the doom video games you know where you're like moving around a maze and on a two-dimensional screen but it looks three-dimensional right yeah um you know if you really want to go full force you got to get the sound right too um and even actually the the apple uh airpods will do spatial audio for you so as you turn your head the sound doesn't turn right so the sound keeps coming from the same spot. <laughs> um, 
So there are lots of gadgets you can do, but really you can just sit in front of your computer and play with it. But it's not nearly as immersive. That's that's the whole cool that's factor of the metaverse is that when you're completely immersed in it, it is as if you're now, you know, entered into your phone and started walking around. <laughs> yeah. Although I will say a lot of the experiences aren't quite that good yet. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of them are, but uh, set your expectations to medium, right? And then you can be pleasantly surprised when you encounter an experience that is uh, better than medium. Well, and that's right, because I I had the Oculus when it first came out, used it on a, with an Android phone, and you know it gave you the 3D experience, and you know it it was cool, you know, and I went to a lot of different mm-hmm. countries and. It, it it really it was a, you know pretty immersive. I loved the sound quality. It, it was fine, but it was still kind of. I didn't like the it, the way it fit on my head and that kind of thing. So I think mm-hmm. uh, that's one of the things. Ease of use with the technology as it gets better will probably happen, you know, and there'll be more and more. But we're still in this infancy, and that's what I caution people. You need to understand, just like twenty some odd years ago. In the dot com world, when people were just really getting into the internet, right? Right. Um, and then there was a lot of speculation. There was a lot of ups and downs. There was money out there. Then there was no one. The dot com, you know, um, boom and the dot com bust is, is is revolutionary. I think the same thing will probably happen in the metaverse world. Uh, mm-hmm. That you're going to have some bubble bursting, just like in real estate. I mean, in real life, yep. you know, yep. you have bust. Uh, because you have to get to a realism, and that just takes time. But think about three years from now, five years from now, seven years from yep. now. It's it you know that's going to be a way of interacting, a way of transacting business, um, just like we do e-commerce today. No one thinks about. I remember the time when you feel like, oh, you're gonna pull out your credit card and just give it to some unknown entity through your your computer. Are you mad? I mean, you know, but then security yep. got better and, and, you know, the trust factors got better. The banks, as you said, or the banks got involved and were guaranteeing your purchases or guaranteeing, you know, if anything went wrong, that you get your money back. Um, so I, I think as that merge between that blue chip world and that new economy world really starts taking shape, uh, we'll have the uh, security uh, that's necessary. So before we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to address uh, with to my audience that you feel that you haven't talked about yet that will probably be um, interesting or actually uh, something they need to know? There's a lot. I have a lot of entrepreneurs that tune in to follow the brand. A lot of people that are starting up businesses or they're in the corporate world and they're looking at getting into business and you know all those things we just talked about. You're like, yeah, how do I get to a Shark Tank type experience where I put together my my cool pet stack and I'm ready to you know to sell to the sharks? I, I, any uh, parting words? Um, I would spend a few moments figuring out your financials proactively. Don't wait until you're going to pitch investors because really. Figuring out the numbers is part of the planning process of creating a business, right? Because it helps you set your pricing, set your expectations. It helps you understand how to drive the car, right? Um, And it helps you plan if you're going to be hiring people, right? It gives you a roadmap and a runway expectation so that you can responsibly hire uh, people internally, but also externally, right? If you're going to hire vendors, you need to be able to pay the vendors, Definitely check out Rocket Proforma, um, just Rocket P R O F O R M A dot com. Um, and again, there's a self directed version and then a version with coaching. Uh, and then definitely check out some of the Web3 stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff happening. Uh, I'm actually a speaker at Miami NFT Week. So it's just Miami NFT Week dot com. It's happening the first weekend in April. It's April 1st through 3rd. Um, it's here in Miami. I'm sure some of it will be available online as well if you're not in Miami, but it's a great place to just jump in and get uh, immersed in this stuff because um, there's definitely some cool stuff happening. Well, this has been phenomenal, Mike, and I'm sure by the time this airs, it might be a little bit after that time, but if people can tune in and definitely tune in to, to Mike and on his website, you'll get a ton of information. Tune in to him also on, on LinkedIn. I think you just type in Mike Lingo. He'll probably pop right up. 
And this has been phenomenal. So I thank you. Thank you very much to being a guest on Follow the Brand. I encourage everyone to see all the episodes on Follow the Brand at www.5starbdm. And that's B for brand, B for development, and M for masters.com. Until next time, you take care, Mike. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on the show. This was great. Not a problem.